Today we're going to get into and learn about the Kirkendall effect. So uh, Ernest Kirkendall uh, was basically, he was a professor, and he saw this effect uh, in 1947 at Wayne State University. Actually saw it as a graduate student. And hopefully, um, if you want to learn more, I love Kirkendall. He's my one of my favorite uh, kind of stories in material science and engineering because um, he basically proposes, we're going to see today, this kind of new theory of how we should approach or how we can think about how do materials diffuse. Um, and uh, he, when he first proposed this as an undergrad, or basically as a graduate student, um, his advisor refused to let him publish his PhD or finish his PhD until he kind of accepted an alternative or kind of the traditional approach for how, um, uh, for how diffusion was thought of, uh, specifically this direct exchange and this ring mechanism that we're going to kind of talk about in just a second. But so he had to basically uh, basically, he had to uh, accept these kind of false uh, and these incorrect kind of interpretations of how diffusion uh, occurred. Then when he went to Wayne State University, he spent you know, several years trying to prove again and again, showing with experiments that his method was correct. It was still debated, and the people, kind of these, uh, the traditional and the kind of powerful people that were behind this direct exchange and this ring diffusion uh, you know, uh, theories really kind of uh, pushed back on him. But it wasn't until years and years later, and eventually, his uh, effect was uh, basically accepted. Um, by that time, he had actually left academia and went into kind of private industry. Uh, but he has a very, very good, um, you know, he had a very uh, kind of zen uh, and really great perspective on the whole thing. He never was bitter about um, not succeeding in academia or that people kind of pushed back on his theory. And really, he was just happy uh, that he had this effect named after him, and he actually forgave the people uh, that kind of really pushed uh, back on him, you know, his idea. So uh, really, really amazing guy. But anyways, let's get into kind of our discussion today. So we've been focusing so far on self-diffusion, uh, just a chemically prepared material just, you know, diffusing within itself. But oftentimes, we want to do the more interesting case, i.e., when I have a diffusion couple. So one of material one, one of material two. So how does a material diffuse when I'm diffusing within, you know, two different materials. I know from, again, from our previous discussion, from thermodynamics, high concentration here, it wants to diffuse over here. This material too wants to diffuse this way. So I know that's gonna, that's basically what the material, how it wants to diffuse, but how is the material going to diffuse? So the genius uh, and kind of the amazing thing that Kirkenthal observed was he set up a similar experiment to this. So this is called, um, let me go ahead and click on here. This type of apparatus, or where we have kind of two materials like fused together, uh, this is a diffusion couple. So this is diffusion couple. So let's go ahead and show that right here. So what Kirkendall did is he basically set up a diffusion couple of copper and brass. So really, copper on one side, zinc on the other side, and he basically placed these molybdenum wires. Why did he place molybdenum? because they're insoluble actually in brass. Um, so he placed these um, molybdenum wires on the sample and he left them, uh, he basically put this diffusion couple in the oven, 785 degrees C for 56 days. And what he observed was that the wires started to move closer together. So these wires started to move, uh, move along the material. So this was shocking um, to people. It was a startling revelation because um, the previous method or the previous kind of thought process for how diffusion occurs, um, the kind of accepted theory of how materials diffuse was via this type of, excuse me, wrong one. Uh, the accepted kind of um, basically framework and how do materials diffuse was via this uh, basically two mechanisms. Two theories were kind of really, really prevalent. The first was this direct exchange mechanism. So in this direct exchange mechanism, let's imagine that we have a plane here. So I have a single plane. Uh, so this is my plane that I'm imagining. So people thought that atoms would vibrate, and then eventually this atom would hop here, this atom would hop underneath, and basically the atoms would, as the name implies, directly exchange. So this was the mechanism uh, that people thought, how do materials diffuse? So let's look at this plane. What is the flux, J, so my flux? What's my flux of atoms across the interface? here. Well, one atom's going over here, one atom's going over here, so I'm, again, across this interface, one's going this way, one's going this way, so the total flux of atoms across my interface is zero. So there's no net flux of atoms. 
So if I were to place like a marker here, you know, again, this atom may move here, this atom may move here, but this line of atoms is never going to change. Or this, you know, this marker is never going to move because there's no flux, right? You know, the atoms may flip spaces, but again, this this array, this line of atoms is never going to kind of move across. So that's kind of the key idea here. So the flux of atoms is zero. There was another mechanism, the kind of the secondly common uh, mechanism was this ring mechanism. Actually it makes a little bit more sense. So there was this kind of collective type of motion. So this is actually easier, right? So instead of an atom, one atom hopping, you know, over or under, you know, kind of switching places here directly, there's this kind of cooperative motion. So it's like a three, a four step mechanism. So this atom moves here, this atom moves here, this atom moves here, and it's a little bit easier. Again, it is, it's going to take a little bit of less energy to kind of move across it. But again, look at this plane. What's the flux of atoms across the plane? So this one goes here, this one goes here, and that's it. The flux of atoms, again, it's zero. So nothing new here. Again, if I have a marker, these planes are not going to move. But what Kirkendall envisioned, Kirkendall, he took my NGR45 course way back in the day. Uh, he knew that at any given temperature, there's some equilibrium concentration of vacancies. And this mechanism, actually, uh, this vacancy mechanism of diffusion is going to be much easier than either one atom, again, hopping over another, or four atoms kind of moving collectively kind of together. That's not a kind of realistic process. So Kirkendall envisioned that atoms are going to move by basically swapping places with vacancies. Or, uh, alternatively, you can think about vacancy diffusion, that vacancies are going to move. So this is the first picture, this is the second picture after our kind of motion. So let's look at this plane. So in this kind of scenario, what's happening here? Well, our atom is going to move from this location to this location. So it's going to cross this plane that we've identified here. Alternatively, you could say that this vacancy is diffusing to this location here. So either our vacancy is moving or our atom is moving, and the both are moving simultaneously. So what is the flux of atoms across this boundary for vacancy? There is some net flux. So there is, so it is non-zero. So there is flux of atoms across this vacancy. So if there's flux of atoms, you could kind of imagine a scenario where there's going to be some planes that are going to be, there's some flux of atoms. Some of these edge dislocations are going to be filled up with atoms, and some of these atoms are going to kind of move as a function of these. So you're going to create or destroy some planes. So let's go back to here. So there can be some scenarios if now, if I put you know, a marker here, or let's say I put a marker here, all of these atoms, this atom can move here, this atom can move away, this atom can move away, this atom can move away, this atom, you know, depending on the concentration of vacancies, and now my plane has disappeared, and it will get pushed away because, again, this atom will, be dis will disappear, and depending on whether I'm creating or destroying planes, this interface will move. This was the key idea. Because the flux is now non-zero, because of this new idea, and again, it's so much easier, right? Like, what's going to be easier? Hopping, hopping uh, places with an atom, doing this kind of ring collective motion, or just swapping places with a vacancy. We're going to find, and actually Perkendall showed, that the prevalent, the most dominant mechanism of diffusion in materials is via this vacancy mechanism. It's easiest energetically, it makes sense, but because the flux of atoms is now non-zero, if you place kind of a line or a marker, this interface will move. If you have kind of these two, uh, if you put a diffusion couple with two materials with two different diffusivities, so that was the genius of Kirkendall. And he had to fight with um, some political, uh, you know, people that didn't want to kind of accept his revelation or not his revelation, excuse me. Uh, they didn't want to accept, um, yeah, his revelation on how materials actually diffuse um, through materials. So the atomic fluxes must have been equal, uh, and thus the uh, velocity interface must be zero if we're dealing with these two mechanisms. But Kirkendall showed that the velocity of this interface was not zero, and thus the atomic fluxes was not zero. So this must be, again, an experiment is experiment is experiment. So he proved this experimentally. So this is kind of the beauty. And again, um, please, you know, for those of you that are watching this on YouTube and not in the class, please read this article. Um, I love this article so much. Um, the discovery and acceptance of the Kirkendall effect, the result of a short research career. It's such a good feel, good story. Um,
should be made into a movie. <laughs> but only I would be interested in because I love this uh, so much. Anyways, so we're going to go now uh, in the next video, and we're going to kind of prove quantitatively um, that this interface is non-zero. So we're going to get into a little bit of math here, but then after that, we're going to kind of show qualitatively how this is going to occur. So thanks, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.